In this interview, I talk with Diana Wu David of the Future Proof Labs. Uh, she helps senior level executives who are looking to get out of their C-level job that are usually in their 50s or 60s, kind of ending that part of their career, wanting to do the next thing. She has a course and community that helps them figure out what that next thing is. We talk in this interview about how she did a 60 podcast to sell her book and course and community programs. Those uh, programs run about $2,000 each. Uh, she talks about how she's generated over $30,000 of revenue uh, using this podcast approach. She talks about how she finds them, how she gets them to interview her, and what she does on the podcast itself in order to convert them to leads and to sell. So hope you enjoyed this interview. Um, so you've had success with one of my favorite partnership types uh, doing podcast interviews. In fact, you've done, I don't know, at least 20 or more podcast interviews where you've gone on someone else's podcast, they've interviewed you about your topic of expertise, you've talked about it, and then you've gotten clients out of their audience who've heard of you, found out about you, and then gone on to buy your courses. Uh, so before going into that, give me a little information, like what is your business, what do you sell, and who do you help? So my business is the Future Proof Lab, and I target senior executives who are going into a transition, uh, and I help them to figure out what they want to do in their next act, usually their second half. So oftentimes it's um, building a portfolio career with uh, writing a book or doing a podcast or um, teaching in, at school, either secondary school or business school or whatever, um, really thinking about what they want to do and then executing on it. And uh, sometimes it's about the money for them, but actually oftentimes it's beyond the money. It's about the mindset. And you have a course in community that helps them do that? Yep. I, I started with a book. Uh, called Future Proof, Reinventing Work in the Age of Acceleration. And that was a natural place to start partnerships. And it was so popular that I started a course um, that's a 10-week course and community and have since done a lot more courses uh, and started offering it to corporates as well. What's the price point of the primary course? Mm -hmm. The price point of the primary course is 2000 right now, sure. but I'm going to raise it because I think that um, people want more handholding and, uh, and they'd be willing to pay. So that, that's what the price point is right now, but I think we'll make it more um, valuable and uh, with price to match. And that $2,000 currently and whatever it goes up to entails the courses, series of videos they go through over the course of 10 weeks and the community is something they stay in long-term or something they only have for the 10 weeks? Uh, the community is long-term. So I'm in the process of migrating for 2021. Uh, right now it's 10 weeks. I have videos, I have um, templates, I have a community where they go in and answer the homework questions and that builds up the community. And then they stay in that. So I do every single month, I do a master class for all the alumni. And sometimes I open it up to, to market basically uh, to new people. And I'm in the process of transitioning to have a community for alumni and people who just wanna buy into that. Yeah. Uh, and then a specific time just for that, um, that group. So. Right now, really, I spend a little time with them, but they just get the course and they keep asking me for more of a high touch experience. And they're not like yours is great because, you know, you get a little bit of a nudge and you have you have the sense of people on the other end, like a personal trainer going, hey, did you yeah. do that yet? Yeah, yeah. And they need more of that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, cool. Okay, so one of the primary ways you have gotten clients for that program has been uh, doing a podcast tour, partnering with people mm -hmm. who have an existing audience and borrowing their audience by going in front of their people and being interviewed by them in a similar way you're doing now. We'll have you know, several hundred or thousand people listen to this interview. A handful of them will be like, oh, I'm a senior level executive who's kind of getting older in their career. And like, I'm thinking about my next step. I should go check out our book or course. And a few people will become leads for you and maybe a couple will buy from you. So when you how did you identify one of the first questions people have and that I have when doing this, and we were making a 
list of potential partner leads for a client yesterday. How do you identify podcasts that have your ideal clients and customers in their audience? Where do you find them? So I look at people who are targeting the same people as uh, the ones that I would like to target. So there's a couple of people who've written similar books or um, people that I like their podcast. Um, and I see oftentimes for, for a podcast, those people have written books and gone on other people's podcasts. Mm -hmm. So starting to see who those people are, who are my competitors, what podcasts do they go on? Mm -hmm. And really thinking about, um, you know, what, whether or not I could get onto those podcasts, but also starting small. So I would say that, um, sorry, my kid just went in and out of the room. They're good. <laughs> We're doing all the <laughs> so late at night. Sorry about that. But, um, you know, just starting small and saying, hey, here's my book. Here's my book launch. I'd love to be on your podcast. Um, I think I have something really valuable for your listeners because mm -hmm. here's something you haven't talked about or here's something that is really good for your audience that you don't talk about um, and really approaching it that way uh, and starting small with people who may not be super popular and then going up, um, going up the ranks to people who were much more popular. So I love the who's my competition or contemporary and where have they gone? That's a question almost anybody can answer, whether they're starting out or a little bit beyond. Like one, one of my favorite things is when you go on a podcast, like if you go on one of these, like I call them like directory podcasts, like Mixer G or Entrepreneur on Fire back when he was doing interviews. And once you're interviewed there, you can then look at anybody that's ever interviewed there before and reach out to them with the common touch point that we've both been on this podcast. So doing something like that yeah. or going straight up to competition and seeing what sites I've been on or what podcasts I've been on, that's, that's really smart. So you do that research, you find, let's say, five or 10 of those after researching for an hour or so. What's what's the process for getting them to agree to interview you? Like, what do you say to them? How do you outreach to them? What does that look like? That's a pretty templated process, I have to admit, because they're okay. always desperate for new content. Mm. Um, it's easier if I have something in common, like I actually know somebody they've interviewed or, you know, I look on LinkedIn where I have over 10,000 connections and I usually might have a connection in common with them. And then I just say, hey, my name is Diana. This is what I offer. Um, this is why I think it's valuable to your audience. And I'd love to come on your podcast. You know, literally it's that easy for a podcast because they are, are desperate for content, um, especially if it's something where it's a weekly podcast or something like that, that they're always looking. And then they come back and sometimes they'll come back and say, hey, you know, I am full up or I'm changing the theme of my podcast or stop back in three months or whatever it is. But it it is partly a numbers game of just um, reaching out to 20 people and, and then having five or 10 respond. Yeah. Out of those five to 10 that responded of the 20 in our theoretical scenario here, how many people would have you on the podcast? Well, I haven't called up Tim Ferriss to be on his podcast. So, you know, maybe I'm just not reaching hard enough, but I would say all of them. <laughs> yeah. Okay, good. And, and I love that. You, another thing you said in the, how do you find people section was start small and work your way up because you get better at pitching and interviewing and everything as you have more reps. So a lot of people oh like God. starting with Oprah and Tony Robbins and these huge people. And they're like, <laughs> you can get to those yeah. people. They're totally conquerable, but uh, but you can't start there if you've never done it before. So that makes sense. Oh, absolutely. And I think podcasting, I mean, I, I have done actually over 60 podcasts and um, I'm still, you know, not as good at it as I'd like to be. Yeah. Um, and so those first ones are miserable. And so I, a lot of the people in my future proof course will say, oh, I'm going to go on a podcast and they'll go on their first one and it'll be great. And then I'll ask them. So did you mention, you know, the, the name of your course? Oh, I forgot about that. <laughs> What's the name of your company? Yeah. Oh, how about your name? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that, that brings me to another question. So it, it seems cool to someone who hasn't done it before. I'm going to go to um, some podcast that has a couple thousand listeners and be interviewed and people are going to hear me. And that's awesome. But the part that's missing from that thought process is 
what's the win for me going on the interview? And what's the win for the interview, the, the interviewer, the person doing the interviewing? So you mentioned being desperate for content. That seems like a fairly obvious win for the podcast owner. But like on a very practical sense, the reason we want to do this is to grow the business and get clients. Um, yeah. So so what is that when you think about, all right, tomorrow you're going to go do three podcast interviews with other people's podcasts. How do you think about the win for you and what is that? So it's a great question because I did do a lot of podcasts. And if I look back, the the lose for me was doing the podcasts that that really weren't targeted towards senior executives who mm. would want to read my book, Future Proof, or take my course um, on future proofing. And I did, I remember a podcast and it was incredibly popular. Uh, and we had a great time and it was on pricing for small businesses. Mm. Um, but it, it wasn't really, you know, the connect wasn't there. Mm. Um, it was with Alicia Butler, who, who is amazing. I love her. And it was gr a great connection. And hopefully we can do a different partnership. Yeah. Uh, but I think the win is really getting very targeted so that you have in the show notes and during the, the um, podcast itself, the ability to give, give people a sense of your personality. So, you know, they get to know and like and trust you and then they can go check you out. And there's always a lead magnet that you have. And for me, it's been um, the future proof checklist because I have a process and everybody says, where do I start? And so it's 11 questions and they can get started. And then if, you know, if they like that, then they go on and on. Yeah. Um, so that's basically, you know, the, the win for me is, has been for them to come and get to know me and get on my email list and ultimately book a course with me or coaching or, um, or an event. So go back to the Alicia Butler example for a minute. I love when things don't work. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> really popular, lots of people commented on it and talked about it, but I'm assuming based on what you said, you didn't get many leads and sales from that. What would you do different? Would you not do the podcast at all? Or would you shift the topic to be something more like overlapping the Venn diagram circles of what, because pricing has nothing to do with what you talk about, but I'm guessing, I don't know Alicia, but I'm assuming that makes sense for her podcast audience. So a partnership yeah, yeah. is when like both people like benefit from it. And if you didn't benefit from that with your objective, then it was a, not a win for you. So if you were to go back and do that again, what would you do different? So, in the beginning, I really did feel like, oh, you want me to be on your podcast? Okay, <laughs> I'll just say yes. Um, and sometimes I'll do that still for people that I, I know or, um, or like. Uh, but for her, I would have talked about it. And if it didn't work, if her target audience wasn't the same, mm -hmm. uh, I would have just had a nice conversation with her in the kind of partnership phase and and not done it because I don't know why, why bother and yeah. you know she doesn't need to be um, she doesn't need to have me on her podcast she can have lots of people who are specialists in pricing and you know eat sleep and breathe small business pricing I just have a small business <laughs> that's sort of my only qualification right it's interesting when you're trying to figure out who to partner with because there's some people that are like directly aligned. Like if you're a mm -hmm. marriage counselor and you find another marriage counseling podcast, um, that's not a direct competitor. Like that's awesome. Also, there might be some that are like tangentially related where they're not like only your target client, but they have concentrations of your target client inside of them. So when you're thinking about who to partner with and reaching out to them and formulating the win for you and win for them, how far will you stretch from absolutely concentrated to my perfect audience, because there's not typically tons of those to the slightly more shorter industries that you can bridge the gap and get the win you want, but also help them. Like, how do you think about that? I'm willing to stretch because there are a lot of podcasts for um, senior executives who are angsty, you know, that feel unfulfilled, that don't really know what they want to do. Um, and part of it was understanding who my key client was. And, you know, so, so in the beginning, I was not sure and used it a bit to see what would happen. Mm -hmm. um, 
And sometimes like one of the podcasts I did with somebody in Australia, um, he's really just got a lifestyle podcast. It's about having more clarity in your life, having more energy in your life. Um, so it's pretty vague, but I did his podcast and I, I listened to them. I liked his energy. I liked his style. And we did the podcast and that one actually did really well. I had hmm. people, you know, emailing me, oh, I heard you on that podcast. I really like that podcast, et cetera. So um, sometimes it'll be something that everybody wants clarity, right? Everybody wants energy, but I know that my people will specifically be um, interested in that and that they might be listening to his podcast. It's hard because podcasts don't, the smaller ones don't really know who's listening to them yeah. all the yeah. time. So I almost wonder, I'm just totally thinking out loud on Alicia's, my hypothesis would be if you'd have talked about a topic closer to you, it was probably less about her audience. I'm just totally guessing. I don't know Alicia at all. No. So this would be totally inaccurate. Pricing is so far removed from your topic that people learned about you, but they didn't bridge the gap between pricing and career clarity. So my guess is if she has a giant podcast, 5% of them, 10% of them, 15% of them, some percentage that's small are your target yeah. audience. But the bridge between topic, it was probably the piece that was missing, but who knows what that was. And clarity, or I should go on and talk about clarity and energy because I have lots of entrepreneurs, you know, they're also at the top of their game going, oh my gosh, totally. I'm not I mean, going to be question, able to do this 20 who years. Who doesn't once a year? Idea. Yeah, exactly. Like who once a year doesn't ask, like, am I like on the right career track? Am I doing the right next step? I mean, I do. And I own my business and have dictated what I'm doing. So it's like, I don't know. Is that, that's, do I want to spend my life doing this? Like, I think that's a not an abnormal question for people to ask. So, yeah. um, okay. So let's jump ahead. You get on the podcast. You have hundreds or thousands of people listen to you. What's the bridge between I listen to your interview and I bought your course? Like, how does that happen? So the bridge is mentioning it in the podcast, very important, something I learned because uh, even if you have it in the show notes, even if they're promoting you, uh, people will go to the podcast. Often it's the promote to the podcast and then they'll, they'll say, oh, this is great, um, but they won't remember Future Proof or maybe they'll remember Diana Wu David because my name's somewhat uh, odd. Um, so the other thing that they do is they always have things in the show notes. So they always have the lead magnet and my lead magnet is always bit.ly prepare for future. So it's easy to remember. So they don't even need to go to the show notes. Yeah. Um, and I have tried it where I just go, Hey, listen to the podcast, buy the course, but the course is too expensive and listening to me on the podcast has not been a great thing. So it generally is here I am first time you've met me. Come and you know delve into my um, my free value, my my lead magnet, my checklist. You can read the book. That's sort of a next step, and that's really quite a lot of getting to know me and my story and how I can help you. Um, and the the course is really the next step from the book. It's like, gosh, I read this book, but I haven't really done anything yet. Even though there's exercises in the book, oh, I can go on a course. Maybe it'll be easier if I have a community of people. And so that's basically what, what the bridge is. Yeah, that makes sense. So mention the product, have a lead magnet, bring them into your world, especially if you're, if you're selling a $97 product, you could probably sell some more direct. If you're selling something in the thousands of dollars, like coaching or high end course, then you probably need a little more warm up and indoctrination of who you are. Uh, that makes and sense. They, so, do so. they do promote. I mean, I would say that if you do, so Podcast people always, the podcasters always promote you on social media and they always often, we don't put it in the partnerships, but they often refer you to other podcasters. I have inbound podcasting requests all the time and the podcasters are going on to other people and the same way they're going, oh, I saw you on so-and-so's podcast. Can you come online? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I think it's, uh, it's been really good for me because people will come to me, but they'll say, I saw you on the podcast and then, you know, oh, I saw you on LinkedIn. And so there's been a lot of touch points that all go to the same destination. So you've done 60 podcast interviews. How much revenue, you can approximate if you don't know the exact number, how much revenue 
have you generated from those interviews and leads you've gotten from the interviews? That is a good question. So when I started podcasts, I um, was really pitching my book because mm -hmm. it came out last year. Uh, so I would say 35 or 40 were when I had not launched my course this year. Yeah. Um, so I sold thousands of books yeah. um, times 15.99. So <laughs> what is that? Yeah. So in the so, 20 plus yeah. thousand dollars of books sold, and then since the last 20 or so you've done that have been since you've had your course, how many copies of your course roughly do you think you've sold from podcast interviews? Mm, that's a good question. I have not calculated the direct revenue. Yeah. Um, I would say though, that it's the course, maybe um, a th I don't know, $8,000. Yeah. I mean, my course is pretty new. Yeah. And the other thing that has happened is um, it's also driven my speaking revenue. Oh, uh, so people will say, oh, I heard you on a podcast or I hear you a lot. I hear you here, here, and here. Mm -hmm. I saw you speak and then I heard you on that podcast and now I want you to come and speak at my company yeah. or do a program. Yeah. And you know, that's actually just beginning. Podcasting is is often a long burn. Mm -hmm. And so you do a partnership. And the great thing is that people are like still discovering it after months and months. And I still have like Peter Winnick is a thought leadership leverage podcast. He's still putting my stuff on Twitter. And mm -hmm. I did a podcast with him like 10 months ago. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so people still are coming and the backlinks you get to your website are are phenomenal. So there's some other stuff that goes along with that that wasn't even part of a partnership agreement. Yeah. Have there been any other type of partnerships outside of podcast interview that have worked well for you? Um, absolutely speaking. And to be fair, I would say you asked me my revenue and yeah. I used to do a lot of partnerships and I have become much more ruthless about my partnership since doing growth university. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> before it would be like partnership and I'd be like, nothing happened. And yeah. you know, then, then I was like, Oh, I didn't ask for anything. Oh. Yeah. That's an easy um, thing yeah. Yeah, just, Cause it's fun. It's, you know, in the beginning, at least it's really fun. And then you're like, Oh, I'm not, seen any business growth so we should yeah, probably fix that. <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah speaking webinars i've i have experimented a lot but speaking at corporates um mm. often they pay me but sometimes i'll do something as a partnership where uh maybe they pay me a little or not so much and they bought a whole bunch of books i sold thousands of books that way mm -hmm. and now they're coming back and saying oh you have this course you know maybe instead of uh, one executive buying it, I can sell it 10 of them for mm -hmm. their team. So that's sort of where it's going now. And I think that um, the speaking has been really useful and webinars also, um, since everything's in COVID, I do it virtually. Yeah. What has been appealing about partnerships as opposed to other marketing strategies that you've tried? Uh, they're not expensive. So... <laughs> <laughs> I did have, uh, you know, I did pay money this year, actually. I paid money for a copywriter. Driven, I think, a lot via insecurity. Like, oh, gosh, somebody said that my copywriting would be so much better, if only, <laughs> yeah. uh, et cetera. And um, all of it was just not, yeah, no. Yeah. So that's, and it's best spoke in a way, and it's with people and, and that just kind of works because it's one person and then you talk to them and then you can make it happen. They don't all work, but yeah. uh, really it's the fact that you don't have to outlay cash. And when you do outlay the cash, you never know what's going to happen. Yeah. So someone's listening to this, they're thinking, okay, I can go do 20 podcast interviews. I can do the things that Diana just said, and I could sell $30,000 plus in my course and books and some more in speaking. Like I, I like that. Any parting advice or tips you would give someone who's about to start using podcasts, maybe specifically uh, doing like a podcast tour uh, for the first time? Yeah, I would start with uh, 
with a handful of podcasts, you know, maybe put that hundred podcast, you know, your hundred favorite podcasts or hundred podcasts that you think would be really good for your business. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I would start with a template, but actually start down and and research them um, to explain to them how your content would help their audience. That is the very basic thing uh, to hook people because even if they are desperate for content, they want it to be meaningful. They're building their brand uh, and also get be ready to help them market their podcast as well. Yeah. So if you can understand that and say, hey, I want to do this thing on your podcast and um, I'll market you and you can market me and it'll be great. I think that that it's virtually um, foolproof. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it's pretty yeah. hard to stand in front of an audience of a couple hundred people be interviewed for 30 minutes to talk about your topic. And for some of those people, just a handful to be like, hmm, I want that. I want her to help me. <laughs> like just the basic mechanics versus what you said earlier of, let me go outlay a lot of cash and see if maybe I can get Facebook ads or a copyright or something to work. There's just yeah. lots of things that can go wrong. That doesn't mean you don't ever do those things because you need to master other things as your business grows. But like, that's pretty hard to screw up the podcast tour or any type of partnership where you stand in front of someone else's audience. So Awesome. Thank you so much, Dana. Perfect. Yeah. And you know, you don't have to, you don't need any equipment per se, maybe a better microphone. You don't have to dress up. It's, it's great. I think it's fantastic. Yeah, I agree. Thank you so much. Audio is also huge, huge on the upswing. Just reading. I mean, just listening in your car, listening in the shower, listening as you go around the house. Like I'm always walking around with an AirPod in my ear, listening to something. And like my relationship with Joe Rogan, somebody that I've obviously never met and never will. <laughs> like I've listened to hundreds of hours of him. Like I know how he thinks pretty well from listening. I was listening to him a while ago. Something about Egypt. I don't even care about Egypt, but I'm listening to it because <laughs> you know, I have a relationship with him now. So yeah, it's a great way to build trust, which is a key factor when selling a teaching product. If you're selling coaching yeah. courses, books, where someone is taking your expertise and trying to apply it to their business, trusting you as being the one that can help solve that career problem or whatever problem that you're solving is huge. And needing more trust than almost any other type of product uh, is needed with course and coaching stuff because they're buying you and your expertise and audio, video, writing. Those are great ways uh, to do that. So yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. I appreciate you taking the time thanks, and thanks for rescheduling. Great. Thanks, Brian. Take care. Thanks so much for having me on. First of all, a really fun interview with Diana. She lives in Hong Kong and we had a little bit of uh, technical issues trying to get on. Uh, But man, I really enjoy talking with her. I love hearing marketing strategies that just seem like, oh, I could do that. Just seems simple. They don't require some special skill set. They don't require dozens of years of experience in marketing. It's like, could I go be interviewed by 60 people? Well, that seems intimidating, but I could have 60 Zoom calls for 30 minutes with someone and just tell my story. That's very doable. And she just painted a very vivid picture for me. There's something we need to be doing, which is I want to have me and our entire leadership team every week doing an interview on someone else's podcast. And one thing I want to be weary of is make sure that the topic we talk about has enough overlap with our topic that we actually get leads and sales out of it. Uh, but man, love this strategy. Love the idea of doing a podcast tour. If you would like us to help you do that, if you'd like us to help you find Uh, 25 podcasts you could go on, help you craft your pitch to them so that they accept your interview request and help you adjust that podcast interview prep so that when you go on that interview, you actually have a good interview, uh, have a good lead magnet and get leads and sales from it. If you want us to help you set up your entire partnership marketing system and do what Diana did, Diana is a client of ours uh, and talked about how uh, going through our system has helped her refine that process and start getting results from it. If you'd like us to help you to do the same thing, let's talk. Go to growthsills.com slash apply. Uh, We'll jump on a call, talk about your business, talk about how this podcast tour concept could apply to you. And if it seems like a good fit, we'll invite you into our coaching program and help you do this. All right, take care.